Good morning. Welcome to church today. It's wonderful to have you join us on this bright, sunshiny day. Um, we are really looking forward to singing with you and singing praises uh, together with you. So please stand as we worship our great God together and give him glory and praise. Shine forever, all the earth, all the 
praising Jesus. Father God, thank you so much that we get to be here this morning. Thank you that we get to join together to worship you and to learn about you and to be with each other. We thank you, Lord, that you sent your son, Jesus. We thank you for the forgiveness that we have. And we thank you that we will live eternally with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a seat. Welcome to those of you whom I have not met I'm Ange, it's nice to meet you. Uh, Come and say hi afterwards. I'd love to actually meet you and get to know you. Uh, We have a lot to go on today and I've got lots of things to tell you about. But the first thing I wanna tell you about is Alpha. We had our first Alpha launch on Tuesday night, just gone. And it was awesome. Um, I was here. It was so fun. And it was great to meet some new people. Um, And there are still more people that I know I need to meet because I didn't get to meet them that time. If you went, oh, I really wanted to go to that and I forgot or life happened and it was crazy and I couldn't get to it uh, or for whatever reason you think you might want to come along, we'd love to have you. It is not too late. Um, Put your name down, come along, join a group and come and see what Alpha is all about. Uh, We'd love to welcome you. So that's on Tuesday night. Uh, coming up, 
we have, oh, tonight, let's do it in order. Tonight, you'll notice that our, our youth church is not here this morning. Usually they join us for the first couple of songs. So that's year five to year eight. Uh, they're not here this morning. They've already gone to their program, but tonight they're going to gate crash 5 p.m. So if you or if you have or if you know someone who might enjoy that, um, 5 p.m. here over in the chapel, they'll be joining church tonight uh, and there's dinner afterwards. Um, I didn't want to promise food if it wasn't actually going to be delivered. That's mean. Um, there is dinner afterwards and uh, it says here that you're having breakfast for dinner. Amazing. Is that wheat bix Oh, okay, bacon and eggs. That makes more sense. Although I think my son will be a bit disappointed. He loves sweet things. All right. Um, one other thing I want to mention, and I know that it's a few weeks out, but I also know how quickly calendars fill up. Um, so for the women, our equip conference is coming up in on the 17th of June. Um, we're going to have a group of people meet here for that conference. We will be doing it online, but we would love for you to go online and sign up. I think it's $22, yep, to sign up and register. Um, and then once you have signed up, if you could pop your name on our sign-up sheet, um, which will be on the table or on out the back, or it'll be here for the next few weeks. That's just so we can gauge numbers and we can give you some morning tea. Um, it's BYO lunch, but we'll give you morning tea, and it's 10 till 3. So pop it in your calendar, 17th of June, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Women, we'd love you all to come along um, and to join us as we do that. Dan's going to come up and share some more things. Great, thanks, Ange. Uh, yeah, we have coming up in uh, just two weeks is our Thanksgiving Sunday. This is a Sunday we set aside as a church to focus on thankfulness, which we think is a really healthy and helpful thing for us to do as a church. Uh, part of the Thanksgiving Sunday, we've always done um, a, an extra opportunity for people to give towards particular projects um, at our church and uh, or, or in ministry generally. And... Um, we're going to do it a little bit differently this year. Uh, what we've done in the past is Thanksgiving Sunday, we've, we've asked people to kind of prayerfully consider what they'd give before the Sunday, and then they'd come and we'd have pledge forms or something like that. What we're going to do this year is we're actually going to, uh, we're inviting people to give in the lead up to Thanksgiving Sunday. So uh, over the next two weeks, we're asking you to prayerfully consider if you would have an extra offer, offer tree of thanks in the lead up to Thanksgiving Sunday. And then on the Sunday, we will be focusing on our thankfulness and just we'll celebrate the giving that has happened on the Sunday. So two projects uh, you, you can see on the screen, our termite empowered renovation. That is our, um, trying to spin that in a positive way. Our hall down the back here, just behind here, has some termites damage in the walls. And uh, so we're going to do a renovation. It's a, it, we're forced to do it, um, but uh, it's also going to be an opportunity to update that space a bit. Um, it's quite an old building, but the cost um, of you know replacing it is far exceeds we think what it will cost to uh, fix it. Uh, so two things are going to happen with that. One is we will um, we will organise a demolition day, which will be uh, um, coming up. It will ha we'll book the date based on the termite pest guy. So uh, middle of June, a couple of weeks away, we'll we'll organise that and we'll let you know about that date. It's you know BYO crowbar and sledgehammer and uh, we'll, we'll remove the internal walls uh, from that. So that's one part. And the other part is just uh, raising some funds to do that. This isn't something that's in our budget. Uh, we can't put a, a price tag on what it's going to cost. Um, it's going to, well, we would expect over $10,000 it'll cost to kind of do that. Just, just doing the pest treatment itself will cost a fair bit, uh, which will be for the whole property, not just that building. We would like the termites not only to die down there, but never find their way up here. So uh, that's the plan. Uh, so that's project one is our, our renovation on the lower hall. Number two is our tax deductible scripture. Um, uh, we combine with the other churches in the area to um, provide scripture in Riverston High. Uh, Miles does that work. He's employed one day a week by the combined churches to do that. But that's a tax deductible thing. There's a website we've set up, lifeac.org.au forward slash Riverston thanks that has the direct instructions on how to give to those two things otherwise it was sent out in our church email this week if you don't get that email you can talk to me and I'll make sure you get on that list but this week the email went out and it has 
those giving options on it. Um, we, uh, you know, churches sometimes get in a little bit of uh, tension over the whole topic of asking people to give towards things, and certainly there's been times where churches have used that inappropriately. Um, it is important for us to just kind of remember at times we are, organ we are a member organisation. Uh, we don't get, uh, despite what some people say about the great tax breaks that uh, churches get, that really isn't a thing in Australia. Um, and so and we, we certainly don't get free money from anywhere. It's just us as a church serving together. But it's more than just the practicalities of giving. Actually, we, we believe it's part of our act of worship of God for our whole lives. Uh, and giving empowers other you know, it empowers ministry. Um, so it empowers more opportunities. But it also is good for our hearts to remember that we rely on God and not on our finances as our primary kind of source of relying and so that's part of why we wrap this up in our thanksgiving space and it's why we invite people every week a reminder about uh, giving to the work of the church so as usual here's our short video on giving come to that time in the service when we pray together so please bow your heads and join with me in prayer our gracious father in heaven we thank you that we can approach your throne with thanksgiving and our prayers and petitions we thank you for the grace to come before you accept our praises in Jesus' name and act in accordance with your divine grace and loving kindness we ask that in your mercy you would receive our prayers. Father God, we pray for our world. We pray for peace and hope to abound. We know that many have been troubled by natural disasters, conflicts, the results of a global pandemic and the rising costs of living. In challenging times, help us to turn to you as our source of strength and hope. Merciful Lord, we pray for your peace to be with all of those who have suffered and who continue to do so. We ask that you would help us to faithfully serve you and the millions of men, women and children that need our help. There are many people, infants, children, teenagers, families and communities that are in need of many things such as counselling, food, hygiene, medical assistance and above all else the gospel. Father, it can be overwhelming, but we know that all things are possible for you. Give us the grace to be like Christ, to give from the abundance that we've been blessed with, so that others might be sustained and come to know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. We do give you thanks for our worldwide church, and we pray for Christians in countries that are torn by war and strife. We pray for the persecuted church around the world. We ask that you would give your people comfort and strength to continue to share your gospel in all places and situations. We do pray for your blessings upon our church here in Australia and Riverson, and we pray for our leaders. We ask that they might seek to be true to your word and filled with your spirit. We pray for our own leadership. We pray for our Archbishop Kanishka, our Bishop Gary, and we pray for our ministers, Dan and Miles. Father, we also recognise the service of their wives and families to us as they support them in their great work. We pray especially, Lord, that you would uh, bless all of those who labour in your name, who serve you here within Riverston on different uh, ministries, whether it's leading life groups, it's helping with the kids, with kids' programs, whether it's supporting... Uh, services through technical work or um, through the music or Bible reading. We pray that you would strengthen and uphold all of your people, that they might continue to do your work. 
and find in the Lord. We do pray that you will bless us this week with a desire to reach out to others with your gospel and the wisdom to do so in a manner that shows them an example of your love, your grace, your mercy and your forgiveness. Amen. Hi, I'm Monica. I'm going to be reading the Bible for us today. Um, Our reading comes from Galatians 3, starting at verse 26 and going to 4, verse 11. If you're new or visiting us today, you may have been given a Bible on your way in. That is yours to keep or hand on to someone else who may need it. So Galatians 3, starting at verse 26. So, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I am saying that is that as long as an heir is under age, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not God's. But now that you know God, or rather, are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Monica. It's so good that you're here. It's good if you're joining us online. My name's Miles. I'm one of the ministers here. And uh, this is the best place to be on a Sunday at 10 a.m. There are different kinds of people in the world. I mean, that, that statement isn't particularly profound. I don't need to convince you of that. You already know that's true. I mean, there are different kinds of people in this building today, let alone the whole world. And, and we can categorise people into large categories. You know, there's men and women, adults, children, uh, ethnicity, religion, but you can, you can narrow it down further. Maybe you could uh, categorise students, what year they're in at school or what they're studying at uni or TAFE. Maybe you categorise people into kind of what industry they work in or maybe you want to look at personality. You know, maybe there's, there's introverts and extroverts. You might not believe me. I'm an introvert, a very loud introvert, but I'm an introvert. I gain energy from being on my own. Lots of different ways that you can categorize people. Here's the most important categories, I think. There are people who, who prefer dogs over cats, of course, uh, and then there are the clinically insane. <laughs> there are people who hate coriander, of course, Uh, and then there are sadists, people who enjoy suffering. There are people who enjoy eating KFC, and then there are just liars. (laughs) They're they're lying to themselves, they're lying to others. A few more, I just want to make sure I try and insult everyone in the room. There are people who prefer winter over summer, of course, Uh, and then there are those who have a refined taste for the inferior. Uh, There are people This is true. I found out about this. There are people who prefer to text rather than call, of course. And then there are serial killers. And of course, (laughs) there are people who like pineapple on pizza. Of course. And then 
there are the unsophisticated peasants. <laughs> Any, anyone still with me? Anyone still on my team for all of those things? There are lots of ways to categorize people, lots of ways to differentiate people. Uh, and that idea is going to be helpful for us as we spend time in this passage. Chapter 3, verse 26 is where we're starting. And if, if you're new or you're feeling new or, or you missed a week, you're not quite sure where we're up to in Galatians, this is perfect. Because chapter 3, verse 26 is just a real nice summary of everything so far. If you have your Bible open, you'll be able to see that the first word in verse 26 is so. It's a connecting word. Word. It's always helpful to notice connecting words in the Bible. They often uh, explain things or provide logic. Very helpful. So, you know, it was forecast to rain, so I took an umbrella. We went to Coles, but we forgot an ingredient for dinner, so we're having two-minute noodles for dinner again. And here, it's like, hey, I'm Paul. Here's the argument I've set forth in chapters one to three, so... In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. And there are two key ideas in that summary verse that I want to just point out to you, catch you up to speed. The first thing is this. Notice what Paul doesn't say. He doesn't say, in Christ Jesus, you might be children of God or you will be children of God. That's not what he says. He says, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God. The gospel of Jesus is characterized by certainty. If you are in Christ, then you are in God's family right now. You are secure. God is your father, and he's a good father who holds his children close to him. On, on Friday, two days ago, uh, Tim Keller passed away. He is just an amazing Christian leader, author, evangelist, so much more. And, and his son, Michael, told the story that in his last days, Tim was praying with his family and he thanked God for all the things. And then he prayed, I'm thankful for the time God has given me, but I'm ready to see Jesus. I can't wait to see Jesus send me home. And that's right. That's the kind of prayer that you can only pray with certainty and confidence in the gospel. I'm ready to see Jesus, and I know I'm on his team. You are children of God. That's the first key idea. Second one, verse 26 isn't over yet. You might have noticed there's two more words at the end. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. Again, notice what Paul doesn't say. He doesn't say, so in Christ Jesus... You are all children of God through faith, plus keeping the Old Testament law. He doesn't say that. Because that was the poisonous message that had infiltrated the Galatian churches. Some false teachers had come along and they said, yeah, it's all about Jesus, plus you've got to keep the Old Testament law. And the Galatian churches listened and it was a disaster. Paul has been real clear for three chapters, and it's clear here as well. In Christ, you are all children of God through faith, full stop. Faith alone. That's the summary. In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. Not you might be children, not through faith plus something. You are children of God through faith. That's it. You're all caught up. That's pretty much Galatians 1 to 3 so far. But there's another idea in verse 26 that we just haven't really talked about yet in this series, and it's what we are through faith. Did you notice it? Christians are all children of God. We're a part of God's family, and, and that is, is mind-blowing. We're a part of God's family. What? That's amazing. I think sometimes the significance of this is lost because of how often we're exposed to this kind of idea. You know, when we pray, we often pray and we say, you know, dear Heavenly Father, and it's like, yep, God's our Father, He's called the Father, that means I'm His son or daughter. Yeah, that's just like a normal thing that I say all the time. No, this is wild. 
This isn't a small thing. This is monumental. God is, is infinitely powerful and majestic and glorious, and I am, am miles. I am unable to get remotely close to living up to his standard. I can't even consistently put my dirty clothes in the washing basket. And I get to call him Father? It's not that God puts up with me. He adopts me as his child. But it gets even more amazing because down in verse 29, you can see there, we're also described as heirs, as inheritors. We get to receive and enjoy the glory and goodness of God's promises. Don't, don't sleep on this. This isn't like a shoulder shrugging, oh yeah, God's our father. No, this is profound. We are God's children. We are his heirs, and that's amazing. And I want to convince you that's true from the rest of this chapter. Jump over to chapter 4. We'll come back to the end of chapter 3 later. Chapter 4, verse 1. Paul has just said that we are God's children, we are God's heirs, and now he's going to explain what he means using an illustration in chapter 4, an illustration about a young boy. Imagine there's a father and a young son. We'll call them Henry and Percy. And one day, Henry the father, he passes away and he leaves everything in his will to his son Percy, this huge inheritance. But Percy is young. And so Henry like wrote in the will that Percy can't access the inheritance until he's older. And until then, his, his two uncles, we'll call them Gordon and Thomas, they're looking after everything and they're keeping it safe. They're keeping it safe until Percy's old enough to receive the inheritance. Now, even though Percy, he owns his father's estate, he owns all the things, he's no better off than a slave because he isn't free to access the estate until he's older. That's verses one and two, with, as you notice, some added Thomas the Tank Engine names to help us remember what's going on. We're going to talk about Percy a lot. That's verses one and two. Verse three, Paul now applies it to us. Look at verse three. So also, when we were under age, that is, when we were like Percy, we were in slavery, that is, we weren't free to access the inheritance. Slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. It was going so well until that bit. That's very confusing. What does Paul mean at the end of that verse? The answer is found in verses 8 to 10. It's quite complicated. I'm going to tell you what I think Paul means, and we can talk about it afterwards if you'd like. Here's, here's what I think he means. In our world, there is a push, a, an encouragement, a force. It's pushing you to be your own Lord, to, to live your own way, just do whatever you want. It's a terrible idea. But that's what the world pushes us, forces us to do. And, and there's a bombshell in verses 8 to 10, and Paul's talking about this, and he says, yep, there are people who ignore God and they just want to be their own Lord. Again, terrible idea. But also, he's talking about religious people who try and earn their salvation, that they're also trying to be their own Lord. Hint, hint, the false teachers who have poisoned the Galatian church. Again, terrible idea. And, and here's this picture. There's these two kinds of people who have been pushed, who have been encouraged, who have been forced far away from God by the world. The person who ignores God is no better off than the person who tries to earn their salvation. So the world pushes people, encourages people, forces people to be their own Lord. Live life your own way. Try and earn salvation. Just do what you want. That is the elemental spiritual forces of the world, I think. And those forces have enslaved us. That's verse 3. We were enslaved by the idea 
that we should just be our own Lord and we should just do what we want. So now with that in mind, let's read verse 3 again. We know what these forces are. Let's read verse 3 again. So also, when we were under age, we're like Percy, we were in slavery, we weren't free to access the inheritance, slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. That is, the slavery is we decided we'd become our own Lord and just do whatever we wanted. That's the picture. And so why does Paul say this? The point is, the picture is, we were just helpless. That's what we were. Helpless, being tossed around by the world, pushed in every direction. We were powerless. We were unable to access the inheritance. We were slaves. We were slaves. Because verse 4, something changes. When the, time, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. When God sends Jesus, he, he's, he's fully human, he was born of a woman, born under the law, he offers to redeem us from slavery that we might receive adoption to sonship, adoption into the family. Because remember, we, we're like Percy. We're in slavery. We can't access the inheritance until we, we grow up, until we come of age. And then in Jesus' life and death and resurrection, he offers to grow us up, to bring us to the proper age so that, we can receive the inheritance promised to us. You got that? Let me say that again. We, like Percy, the inheritance is out of reach. We're not old enough. And so Jesus offers to, to grow us up, to bring us to age so that we can access, access that inheritance. And what is the inheritance? I mean, for Percy, it's just like stuff, his father's estate, meaningless. Who cares? Our inheritance is infinitely more precious and significant and life-changing because our inheritance is redemption. Did you see it? Jesus offers to redeem us, to buy us back at a price, to purchase us out of slavery where the price is his own life. Just such a beautiful picture. Jesus offers to redeem us at his own expense. But our inheritance is, is more than just redemption. It's also adoption. We're now a part of the family. Think about it this way. Jesus' death isn't just a, a pardon and release from death row. It also brings us to his home for family dinner. And now there's like a bedroom with my name on it and the post comes to the letterbox and the Wi-Fi connects automatically because I'm part of the family. I'm home. Jesus' death isn't just a pardon and a release from death row. It's signed adoption papers and now I'm a part of a family. Just notice the distance we've just travelled. We were slaves, being pushed around by the world, and now we're in God's family. We were slaves like Percy, the inheritance inaccessible, and now through Jesus, he's grown us up, and now it's completely us. We were on death row, and now the Wi-Fi connects automatically, because we're home. Just, just... Notice that distance, that change, that transformation. Has it sunk in for you? The significance of being in God's family? This isn't a shoulder shrugging thing. Yeah, God's my father, I'm his son. No, no, God is my father. He has redeemed me. He's rescued me from death row and he has adopted me. And I'm his son and now I live in the family home. That's amazing. 
You know, sometimes in sermons, there's, there's an application. There's a, you know, you, you should go and do this. You should go and change this. That's a good thing to do. Today, I just want this to sink in for you. Just know this truth and love this truth more. Love it more intimately. God is your father. You were enslaved. You were on death row and he redeemed you. And now you're a part of the family. That is a big deal. You know, if you're here and you don't yet know Jesus, I'm, I'm going to say something to you that I never thought that I'd ever say as a minister. Here it is. Grow up. Not grow up, get older. Not grow up, become more mature. But grow up and receive the inheritance promised to you. Because Paul says, you are currently like Percy. You're like a slave. There's this inheritance. It's promised, but you need to grow up to get it, to receive it. And the only way to, to grow up is to be redeemed by Jesus, to be purchased out of slavery. And the only way to be redeemed by Jesus is to put your trust in him for the forgiveness of sins. And so for you today, he, here's what you just you need to hear. You need to grow up so that you can come of age and receive your promised inheritance and join God's family. There's so much to, more to say from this passage, so little time. Being adopted into God's family is just, it's amazing. It's already amazing. There's three more things that this passage tells us that are a part of the inheritance. And I just want to flag them for you so that you can appreciate God even more. The first one is in chapter 4, verse 6. Now remember, you were a slave, God redeemed you, he adopted you, and now he lives in you through the Holy Spirit. And you can call out, Abba, Father. Abba is the equivalent of, of Papa, Dad, Daddy, which makes sense because you're a part of the family now. You can talk to God. God isn't like a stern father sitting at the opposite end of a long dining table in a cold room. And he's like watching you to make sure you eat your vegetables. And the only time he says anything is to correct your table manners. You know, distant, impersonal, a bit scary. That's not what he's like. He's near. He listens. God cares. Maybe he still makes you eat your vegetables. They're still good for you. But you can talk to him, and you should talk to him, because he's near. That's the first one. The second one is back in chapter 3, verse 27. God clothes you with Christ. This is such a profound image. We could talk about this for ages. Here's, here's one thing that it means. When God clothes you with Christ, he covers you. He covers your shame. When God rescued you from death row, pardoned, rescued, now you're part of the family, it's not like he, he leaves the prison clothes on you so you can like look down and be reminded, oh, that's right. No, no. You are clothed with Christ. You're now on Jesus' team and you get to wear the uniform. That picture makes sense to us, right? I played football for the Mulgoa Black Swans and so when I played, I wore the team uniform. People knew who I was. And in a similar way, I'm on Jesus' team. And I get to wear the uniform. And that's a uniform I don't take off. Because following Jesus is now where I can find my primary and my ultimate identity. Here's a, here's a light and easy question for you on a Sunday morning. Who are you? If you're a Christian, the answer is, I'm a child of God, or something similar. The answer isn't, oh yeah, I'm a teacher, I'm a student, I'm a parent, I'm a sports person, I'm a muso, I'm a foodie, I'm a tradie. That's secondary. Our primary identity is found in Christ. We get to wear that uniform that covers our shame. That's the second extra thing we get. And the last one related to that, chapter 3, verse 28, when you join God's family, it's not just you and 
God and Jesus like hanging out together. It's billions of people throughout human history all wearing Jesus' uniform. There's no barrier between Jew and Gentile, between slave and free, between men and women. There's no barrier. There's diversity, of course, a healthy diversity. Elsewhere in the Bible, the church is described as a body that needs all the different parts. Just this week, I was talking to someone, and we're talking about how wonderful it is that here at this church in Riverston, we only have one Miles. That is a good thing. No more, please. And we have whatever, 200-ish other people with different skills and personalities and abilities and volumes, and there's diversity within God's family, of course, but if we step back, God's family is filled with one kind of person. Billions of people, one kind of person. At the start, we said this, didn't we? Sometimes you can, you can categorize people. There's different ways of talking about people. I said some mean things about cats and summer, and here's, here's, here's how we're going to end. There's two types of people in this world. The first kind is those who were slaves. But they have now been redeemed, adopted, given a spirit, clothed, and joined this big family. And if that's you, I hope you can again just feel the distance that you've traveled from slave to family and that you can just rejoy, uh, respond with joy and thankfulness. Maybe, maybe you have a specific thing that you need to do. Maybe the Spirit is telling you, pushing you to like do something or change something, but I hope today you can just let it sink in. I'm a child of God. And the second kind of person are those who Paul describes, they're still like Percy. They're like slaves being pushed around by the world who have this inheritance, if only they could grow up and grab it. And there's no way to do that without Jesus. And if that's you, then maybe today is the day where you join Jesus' team, where you put on his uniform so you can grow up and receive your promised inheritance. Maybe you're not ready for that yet. Maybe today is a day to sign up for Alpha and to come to that and to keep thinking about all this, to double check whether this is actually true. But here's the truth. Here's the weight of this morning. If you are in Christ, you are a child of God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that we can call you Father. Help us to never underestimate or underappreciate the significance of us being adopted in your family. And we do pray for those people here and those people that we know who haven't yet accepted Jesus and received their inheritance. Father, please, would you make yourself known to them? And we pray for those people here, and again, those people that we know who have accepted Jesus. Father, would you fill us with understanding and with joy and with thankfulness and with confidence? You are a good Father, and so we pray these things because we love you and because we trust you. Amen. Um, thanks, Miles. Uh, the kids are going to join us soon, I think. That's the plan. So when they come in, don't be scared. They're meant to. Um, but we will finish up by singing a few songs uh, as we respond and we kind of think about what Miles has said and how that is um, sinking down into our hearts. Um, we're going to sing a song uh, which is called Jesus is Better. If we're, on, if we're on God's team as a child of God, if we are on his side um, and we know that his, his, the way, his way is better, um, so please stand as we'll sing together.
There is no other so sure and steady. My hope is held in your hand. When castles crumble and breath is fleeting, upon this rock I will stand. rock I will stand
so much for joining us this morning. It's been really wonderful to be here with you, um, to hear Miles bring God's Word to us and to be able to worship our amazing God. Uh, we have some morning tea uh, this morning uh, with a coffee machine is all warmed up. Rosie and Gary are there ready to make you your tea, coffee, cappuccino, whatever it is you would like. Um, so we'd love for you to stick around and have a chat, uh, maybe meet someone new. There are definitely people here that I can see that I haven't said hello to yet, so I'd love to meet you. Uh, so hang around, have something to eat, have a coffee, enjoy the beautiful sunshine. Uh, Alpha is on Tuesday night. We would love to see you, uh, whether you were there before or whether this will be your first one, we'd love you to come along. Uh, and if you've got any other questions about the other things we mentioned, come and have a chat. Um, love to talk to you. I'm just going to close in prayer for us. Father God, thank you so much that we got to be here today. Thank you that we get to be together and share in your word. Thank you that uh, we can worship you. Thank you that you are a mighty God and a good God, that you're, you are no, no one is higher than you uh, and that we get the priv privilege of being adopted into your family and that we get to be with you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next week. <laughs>